praise the Lord. This is Elder Henry Reinhardt coming to you from my home office. And I have a very important teaching, very brief important teaching that I want to do today. And it is being directed to those who have been deceived to think that they have received Christ when they have not. You see, we have a situation where in most cases, people are told that they have received Christ when in reality they have not received Christ and their lives have not been changed. So I want to talk directly to those people today. And I also want to talk to uh, another group of people who are sure, they're, they're just sure that they're saved. They're sure that they have been born again. But their lives don't truly reflect that. And some of them are confused as to why that is the case. So I want to talk to those people today, and I want to talk to you in the form of a question. Did you really receive Christ, or were you deceived? Again, the question is, did you really receive Christ, or were you deceived? Frequently I see posts on Facebook claiming that certain individuals or certain groups of people received Christ due to some special evangelical outreach meeting or some sort of service. Often people read these postings that are put up and they get all excited because they think that a powerful move of God is going on. But we need to ask ourselves the question, is that really what is happening in these events? Unfortunately, most of the time, that one hears about someone receiving Christ. It means that someone has been told that Jesus died for them and that he loves them and they're told that all they have to do is to say some sort of sinner's prayer that has been made up and receive Jesus in their heart and that they will be saved. Often, matter of fact, very often, a passage of scripture from Romans chapter 10 verse 9 is recited with the hearers and they are told after the reciting of that scripture and after mouthing a few words, they're told that they're saved. And Romans 10, 9 reads that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And first of all, this scripture is not the doctrine of salvation for the New Testament. This scripture in Romans 10, 9 is taken from the epistle to the Roman church. The epistles were written to the church, to the saints of God, to people who are already in Christ. The doctrine of salvation is not written in the epistle to these people. There would be no need. It would be rather foolish 
for the Apostle Paul to write to the people in the Roman church and tell them how to be saved. They're already saved. They're already saints of God. But what, what happens when people teach this heresy is they take scriptures like this, pull it out of its proper context, give it a meaning that it does not have, and tell people the misinformation that all they have to do is just confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead and that's all they have to do. And they're not, and then they're saved. But you notice in this scripture here, there's nothing said about repentance. There's nothing said about the necessity of being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And there's nothing said about having to receive the Holy Ghost to be saved and to be in the body of Christ. Nothing is said there. And the reason nothing said there is because this scripture passage is written to saints of God, to people who have already repented. They've already been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. They've already been filled with the Holy Ghost. So it wouldn't make any sense to tell them that's what they have to do when they've already done it. But I read that to you and discussed that briefly to you so that you will understand that that is not the doctrine of salvation for the New Testament church. That is not how people are supposed to be saved in the New Testament church. So, they leave these meetings, these types of meetings where they're told these things, thinking that they've already been saved. They're deceived. They have not been saved, but they think they've been saved. But they soon go right back to the life that they were living before they attended the meetings, these so-called revival meetings. They go back and they realize they're living the same life they lived before. And they realize that no change has been made in their lives. You know, at this point they become rather confused because they were told that they were saved and that they, they were new creatures in Christ, but they don't see any change. And they don't realize any power in their lives to do what the Lord requires them to do. And they just go right back in their lives doing the same thing. And if, if you have been saved, if a person has truly been saved, the scripture says that, that if any man be in Christ, He's a new creature. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. When a person is truly, truly saved, according to the scriptures in the New Testament, when, he, when a person is truly saved, there will be a change. There's no two ways about it. There will be a change. That person will not be the same person that they were before their encounter with the Lord. So they become confused because they don't see any change. They're going right back and they're doing the same things that they were doing before. Often they later become very frustrated and they begin to question and to doubt the salvation that they supposedly had received at these meetings, these so-called revival meetings. Incidentally, this, this, was, this was the result from a great many people who would attend these Billy Graham crusades. Billy Graham, a man, is... is, is has passed on, and you know, but he was a very well-known so-called evangelist. 
that traveled throughout the country and held these large so-called revival services. Sometimes he would hold them in big football stadiums and the stadiums would be full of people listening to him and believing the heresy that he preached concerning salvation. And many of them would hear him tell them all he had to, all they had to do was repeat after him and say some kind of sinner's prayer and repeat a few words and then that they were saved, they would change. Well, they would leave these huge football stadiums, these so-called revival meetings, go back home and they would find out and they'd realize that there had been no change in their lives. There was no new power in their lives. They had been deceived, and they had been taught a watered-down false gospel. And this happened to many, many, many people over the years where Billy Graham would have these crusades. You see, the true message of salvation, the true message of salvation, and there's only one, was never really preached at these meetings. And people were not really receiving Christ. So what is the what is the real problem? Well the real problem is that such people have not really received Christ at all after these encounters at these so-called revival meetings. They haven't been revived at all. They have been the recipients of heresy, otherwise known as false doctrine. To truly receive Christ, I want you to hear me, to truly receive Christ, a change has to be made in the lives of those who receive him. One has to be born again of water and of the Spirit. You see, there's a sin issue that must be dealt with. And it can't be resolved. The sin issue can't be resolved simply by repeating a so-called sinner's prayer and by saying, I receive Jesus in my heart. First of all, one must repent. That means one has to become godly sorry in their hearts and be ready to turn away from their life of sin. And then they must be baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. Remission means forgiving, washing away of their sins. Through that act of baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, their sins are forgiven or washed away. And the sin issue at that point is resolved with God. Now, there are many who say, well, baptism does not wash away sins. There are many who say that. Well, the problem with what they say is, the scriptures say that it does. Mm -hmm. The very thing that they say, repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus Christ does not do, the scriptures say that it does. And the scriptures are right. Amen. The scriptures are right. Not someone's opinion or someone's thoughts. 
the scriptures are right. The word of God is right. The word of God trumps anybody's thoughts and opinions. The scriptures say that washing away sins occurs with the baptism in the name of Jesus Christ following their repentance. I'm going to read a little short passage from Acts chapter 22, verse 16. And it says, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins calling on the name of the Lord. Now this, this is what happened. This is a record of what happened. Paul, the Apostle Paul, is relating what happened to him after his experience on the road to Damascus. And he was told to go down and to meet a man by the name of Ananias. When Ananias came and he met him, amen, Ananias tells him what I just read. He tells Paul, he says, why, why tarriest thou? In other words, what are you waiting on? Arise and be baptized and wash, notice what it says, and wash away thy sins calling on the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is Jesus Christ. So he's telling him to come, what are you waiting on? Arise and let's go and have, get you baptized for what? To wash away your sins. <coughs> this was the purpose, to wash away or to remit the remission of your sins. So the very thing that people claim baptism in the name of Jesus Christ does not do is the very thing that it does do. And here's another scriptural record of the fact that that is what it does. And this is from the Apostle Paul. Amen. The writer of the majority of the New Testament epistles. This is the man here relating how his sins were washed away. I'll believe the word of God, the written word of God over your opinion and your thoughts, whoever you are. I'll believe the word of God over you. And anybody that wants to be saved had better have that same mindset. You better be ready and willing to believe the word of God if you really want to be saved. You better believe the word of God above anyone else's thoughts and opinions. Then, let's go further. Then, someone that wants to be saved must be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost which always, and I put parentheses around always, which always comes with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. As God's Spirit gives utterance, it's God's Spirit that gives the utterance, it's God's Spirit that speaks, but this must accompany the indwelling, the filling, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that is the initial first evidence that the person has been filled. So only after the rebirth of the Spirit does one receive power to live a changed life of holiness and sanctification. You see, it takes power it takes power to live holy. It takes power to live a sanctified life. <clears throat> it takes power to live a life free of sin. Glory to God. 
and, and the secret to living a life free of sin is to walk in the Spirit. But you can't walk in the Spirit if you don't have the Spirit within you. That's why receiving the Holy Ghost is so crucial. And most of these people who go to these meetings and have these so-called rebirth experiences, most of them have not received the Holy Ghost. Therefore, they have no power to live holy. They have no power to overcome sin. And so that's the reason why they go back to doing the very same thing they did before, because there's been no change. So this is the true scriptural way to receive Christ. And it is the only way. There must be repentance. There must be baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in water for the remission of sins. And then there must be the receiving of the Holy Ghost in order that the individual would have power to live a life of holiness. This is the way of salvation that was originally preached by the apostles in the city of Jerusalem almost 2,000 years ago, just as Jesus said it would be. Listen to what the Lord Jesus said to his apostles. He said, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And this is recorded in Luke chapter 24, verses 46 and 47. Several days after Jesus spoke these words to the apostles, on the day of Pentecost, in the city of Jerusalem, the first message of salvation for the church, for this dispensation of grace, was preached, and repentance and remission of sins was indeed preached in the name of Jesus Christ, just like Jesus said it should be. The Apostle Peter, who was the, the Apostle who preached that inaugural the message, that first message, he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. This comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. So, think, think about this fact. Think about this fact. On that day in Jerusalem, the day of Pentecost, almost 2,000 years ago, the scriptures tell us that some 3,000 people were saved. That means that 3,000 people repented, were baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost on that day, that same day. And I'm going to read a passage, a very brief passage. 
Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Talking about the word of Peter, the apostle Peter. They that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. This reading comes from Acts chapter 2, verse 41. So this same message of salvation, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That same message of salvation was preached by the apostles and by the evangelists throughout the book of the Acts of the Apostles. <clears throat> First, it was preached in the city of Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost first fell. Then it was preached in Judea and Samaria. And then it was preached at the house of Cornelius. And in the upper coast of Ephesus by the Apostle Paul. This same message of salvation that was first preached in Jerusalem of repentance and remission of sins was preached again in Judea, Samaria, at the house of Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion, and later by the Apostle Paul after his rebirth in the upper coast of Ephesus to a group of former disciples of John the Baptist. The same gospel. It's just one gospel. The book of the Acts of the Apostles is where the doctrine of salvation for the New Testament is preached. That's where that will be found. Not in the epistles, for the epistles were written to the church. The epistles were written to saints of God, to people who had already been saved. So that's not where you're going to find the doctrine of salvation. The doctrine of salvation is found in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. So there, there's no other true message of salvation. And any message other than this message of salvation that I've been talking about is nothing but a heresy. Anybody that's coming with a different message, a different doctrine of salvation than repentance, baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and being filled with the Holy Ghost, Anybody's coming with any doctrine different than that is preaching and teaching heresy and should not be listened to. And any other doctrine than that is not going to save you. And it is not going to give you the power you're going to need to live a holy and a sanctified life. And this is what God requires. God said, be ye holy. For I am holy. God is demanding a holy people. He will accept nothing less than holiness. We're told to follow peace with all men. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. we got to be holy. And the only way we're going to be holy is to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost that will give us power to live a holy life that is above and free from sin. Now that's admittedly a straight and a narrow way. But it's the right way. That is what it truly means to receive Christ. And if you have not had that scriptural born-again experience, you have not received Christ. 
in your life has truly not been changed? That's the answer to all of your confusion and befuddlement. Those of you who have been told that you've received Christ, but then you realize afterward that you haven't changed, that you have no power to change, that nothing has truly happened in your life to change you. The reason why you don't have that experience is because you haven't done it the right way. You have not truly been born again of water and the Spirit. You have not truly received Christ. You were told a lie. You were deceived. You were spoken to by someone that was teaching and preaching heresy. That's why. You have not received what you said, what they said you had received. You have not truly received Christ. You have not truly been born again of water and the Spirit. And that's why your life has not changed. One cannot truly receive Christ and their lives not be changed. In other words, once you truly receive Christ, your life will be changed. No doubt about it. Your life will be changed. For the scriptures tell us that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And this comes from 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, verse 17. You can't change your life your own way or by the way of some false doctrine of salvation. But your sins must be washed away in the name of Jesus Christ, following your repentance. And you must receive the power that only comes through receiving the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> For those of you, those few of you who will hear this, glory to God. May the Lord grant you a heart of repentance and a willingness to obey his word and to truly receive Christ the way the scriptures say you must receive him. Until you do this, you will not have received Christ and you will not be saved. Glory to God. Until you hear the word of God, which is what I'm speaking to you right now, and repent of your sins and submit to baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or washing away of your sins and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Until you do that, you have not received Christ. I don't care what the preachers of false doctrine are telling you, until you do that, you have not received Christ. May the Lord bless you to hear this, to believe it, and to humble yourself and to find someone who will baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and seek the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which will come with the evidence of speaking in tongues. God bless you.